Okay, so let me first take this opportunity. We're starting the semester uh, of the seminar. I think uh, towards the end of last semester, we tended to have a few open cameras. So let's try and stick with open cameras as much as we can uh, this, uh, uh, on this semester. And uh, we're very happy to open, to open this semester with uh, Omer Tamuz from Caltech, who will tell us about uh, stochastic dominance and monotone additive statistics. Omer, please. Okay, thank you very much. It's nice, it's nice to have some faces. I gave a talk to all blank cameras except the host at a certain university in Boston whose name starts with an H, but I, I won't name. And it wasn't the most, uh, the most pleasant experience. Um, okay, so this is joint with um, Tobias Fritz, who's at Innsbruck in Austria, uh, Shaosheng Mu at Princeton, Luciano Pomato, who's my next door office neighbor at Caltech, and, uh, and Philip Stock at, at Yale. And I'm going to talk about a number of papers, different ones with different subsets of these, uh, of these co-ops. And please feel free to, I probably don't have to ask, but please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions as, as we go. Um, okay, so um, stochastic dominance and monotone additive statistics. I'll, this term monotone additive statistics is something that, that we made up and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to explain. I'll also explain what stochastic dominance is if, if I need to. So what's a statistic? I'm gonna think of a statistic as a way to take a distribution over the reals and summarize it by single number. So if you wanna keep something in mind, think of the expectation or the median. It's a, it's a functional that takes as an input a random variable, but really only looks at its distribution and output some, some number. Oh, sorry, I have to um, fix something here. Um, oh, no. Um, pardon me one second, I need to, I need to fix something in my, um, in my uh, slides. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I, I didn't want you to, to see what's, what's coming ahead. So, so here's, here's the formal definition of a statistic. I'm gonna fix some um, non-atomic probability space and some subset of the random variables. Our main example will be L infinity, so all the bounded random variables. And a statistic, it's simply a map from the set of random variables to R, so it assigns a, a real number to each real random variable. And it has the following two properties. If I give it just a constant random variable, it returns that constant. So again, think the expectation. I'm trying to just capture a distribution by one number. So when I, when, when, when I capture just a, the constant random variable, I want to give you that number back. And two, if x and y have the same distribution, then phi of x equals to phi of y. So we can maybe another way to define this would be to think of phi as a map on the probability measures on R. And maybe if we're looking at L infinity, these would be the, the you know, compactly supported probability measures on R. But there, there are some notational advantages to, to thinking about random variables. Okay, so I'm gonna say that a statistic is monotone if whenever um, X um, stochastically dominates Y, this statistic assigns a higher number to X than to Y. Okay, so just a, a quick reminder about stochastic dominance. I'm going to say that x dominates y if there's x tilde and y tilde, so that x tilde has the same distribution of x, y tilde has the same distribution of y, and x tilde is bigger than y tilde almost surely. Okay, so, so maybe the right way to think about it is that x dominates y if I can start from the distribution of x, move mass to the right, and arrive at the distribution of, of y. So somehow the mass of x is to the right of the mass of y. And there are two useful equivalent definitions. Um, one is that the expectation of any, every increasing function of x is bigger than that of y when these expectations are, 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 are defined. And a very simple equivalent again definition is that the CDF of x is pointwise lower than the CDF of y. Okay, so these are all very standard things, but if you haven't seen these definitions before, this, this might be a lot, so I'm, I'm is glad that, to is that 
is that lower, not uh, not higher? I mean, um, yes, the CDF has to be lower no. because the mass to the left of every given number on X is less than the mass of Y. So, so say the, the mass on the negative of, 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 of X, the CDF at zero, is less than that of Y because X- Okay, yeah, the, its chances is, of being a smaller are smaller, yes, okay. Yes, yes, yes exactly. It. Yeah, it's confusing because it goes sort of the, the other way. So these are all equivalent uh, definitions. I'm going to say that a statistic is additive if phi of X plus Y is equal to phi of X plus phi of Y, but just for independent random variables, x and y, okay? So if we think of phi as actually a map defined on the probability measures, then this just means that it's, it's, it's additive under convolution. So if now mu is the, is the law, the, measure, the distribution of x, and nu is the distribution of y, it means that phi of mu convolution nu is the sum of phi of mu, phi of nu. So, so uh, you can just think of this as phi being a homomorphism from this semi-group of measures with the operation of convolution to R. So that's an additive statistic. And um, the question that, uh, the, the, the main question that I'm gonna ask is, what are the monotone additive statistics? So in terms of this language of homomorphism, these are the monotone homomorphisms from the partially ordered semi-group of measures with, with a partial order stochastic dominance to the ordered group, uh, ordered semigroup R. Um, and I'll focus on the case L infinity. So what are all the ways to capture a bounded distribution on the reals that has the two properties of monotonicity and additivity? If I move mass to the right, I want this to become a bigger number. And if I take the sum of two independent random variables, I want to get the, the sum of what I assign to each one of them. That's, that's the question. So I'll start with L infinity, and then I'll continue to, to larger spaces. Okay? Now, one example of such a phi... Can I ask, it, can the, I ask sorry? a question? Yeah. Can yeah, I yeah. ask a quick question? So please, by L please. infinity, you mean compact support of the yes. distribution? Okay. Yes. Thanks. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, one example of such a phi is the expectation, right? So the expectation, it's additive for independent random variables. In fact, it's additive for any random variables, but, and it's monotone with respect to stochastic dominance. I move mass to the right, I just increase the expectation. I wanna give a, a sort of a, a, a semi and an applied motivation for these properties. So, you know, okay, this is maybe not very well thought out, but bear with me. Imagine that you have to design an algorithm for, for a, an autonomous car. So it has, to, it has to get from A to B, and there are two ways to get there. You can either take the red road or the, or the blue road, and you want to take the shorter road. Um, so so the, the road that will take less time, not the shorter in distance, the shorter in time. Now, you don't know exactly how long it's going to take you. So when, if you go this way, it'll take some amount of time X. If you go this way, it'll take some amount of time why? So you, wanna, you want some criterion to choose how to go. So a natural way to just reformulate um, this problem is I'm going to have some statistic that will take this random amount x, this random y, y and translate them to, 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 to a number each. And then I'll just compare these numbers and choose the lesser one. So a way of thinking about it is for, for this algorithm, a random amount x is equivalent to a certain amount phi of x. So it's just a way of, of, of taking a random amount, turning it into something equivalent that's, that's a fixed amount, and then using that to maybe make a decision. Now, if, if you want to be more morbid, you can ask, I want to go left or right. I have to decide if to, you know, save this many people or that many people. And these are random amounts, and I, I need a way to, to make this decision. But let's stick with time for now. So, so here, monotonicity is a natural criterion. If I have two distributions, X and Y, and X dominates Y, it's natural to, that phi of X would be bigger than phi of Y. And therefore, you know, I'll choose the one that's dominated in this case because I prefer shorter times. So what about additivity? Why is additivity a sort of nice property for, for an algorithm like this? Well, imagine that I have to um, 
I have to go from again from A to B, and I have to decide if to go, if to take uh, the red road or the or the blue road, and which will take me either X or Y. But after I get to B, I have to continue to C, and there's only one way to go, and that'll take Z time. And there's uncertainty everywhere, you know, the traffic lights, the I don't know what, but but Z is going to be independent of X and Y. Then maybe what I want is that it doesn't really matter whether I have to continue from B to C or not. If I choose X over Y, I do it regardless of what Z is. So if the driver tells me I want to get from A to B, I don't have to guess if afterwards the driver will also ask me to go to C. Because really my choice here is not between X and Y, it's between X plus Z and Y plus Z. So what I want is an algorithm where the choice between X and Y is the same as the choice between X plus Z and Y plus Z when Z is independent of X and Y. And here's a very simple claim. It says that if phi of, suppose that the, this phi has the property that phi of X is bigger than phi of Y implies that phi of X plus Z is bigger than phi of Y plus Z for all Z independent of X and Y. That is, whenever I take X over Y, I will also take X plus Z over Y plus Z, no matter what Z is. Then phi is additive. So this is equivalent to, to, to being additive. Or this implies that you're additive, but the, the equivalence is easy to see. So in fact, I'll, I'll show you a stronger claim. Suppose that equality of phi of X and phi of Y implies that phi of X plus Z is equal to phi of Y plus Z for all Z that are independent of X and Y. Then I claim that phi is additive. So this is a, a three-line proof. So suppose that X and Y um, are independent. Now remember that phi of phi of y, so here phi of y is just a number, but I think about it as the constant random variable, is again equal to phi of y. So this is the property that we have as a statistic. When I throw in a constant, I get the constant back out. So what do I have? Okay, so this, this is a bit of a boring calculation, but phi of y plus x is the same as phi of phi of y plus x. Why is that? Because phi of y and phi of phi of y are the same. So by the assumption here, the two sides are equal because I add x to both of them. What I have on this side, phi of phi of y plus x is the same as this. I just exchange x and phi of y. And now I apply the same thing again. x and phi of x are the same, and I add the same thing to them. What I have here is just phi of a number, which is equal to that number again. So I get that phi of y plus x is equal to phi of x plus phi of y. Okay, so th this was just a little motivation for why maybe having this sort of additive statistic uh, is interesting. Any questions so far? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what did you use here, independence? Um, well, I wanna show that if X and Y are independent, then um, it, that then five uh, then five x plus y is equal five x plus five of y. Where did I use independence? Um, right. So the, because these are constants, the, this is all in the um, in the assumption only. Right. Yeah, so, when you so move from I, x plus all, y to phi of y plus x, you need to use the, the assumption that you can yeah. move to adding an independent object and constant. Exactly. So, so for, this, for this to be true, then uh, x and y have to be independent. Because the, the, I colored red here, so the x here plays the role of z, and z has to be independent of both x and y. That's our, that's our assumption. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so, let's, so, so I, I'm going back to the question. What are the monotone additive statistics on L infinity? So I want to assign to each bounded random variable a number in a way that's monotone and additive. So let's look at what examples, what examples we have. One example is the expectation. Another example is the essential maximum, so the maximum of the support. This is obviously monotone with stochastic dominance. I move mass to the right, it only increases the maximum weekly. And it's also additive. If I take two independent random variables and add them together, the maximum of the sum will be the sum of the maximum. And the same thing for the essential minimum. A more interesting example is what I'm going to call the normalized cumulant generating function. So, um, so for each a different than zero, I'm going to define a function k a that takes as an input a random variable x 
and returns the cumulant generating function evaluated at A and then normalized by one over A, okay? So this is the moment generating function. I take the log of that and I normalize by one over A. The, the reason that I'm normalizing is so that when I put in a constant here, I get the same constant out here, right? So if X is just a constant, this is just equal to X again, okay? Now, this is additive because, well, for independent random variables, the moment generating function is multiplicative. I take the log and, and it's additive. And it's monotone because I'm taking here the integral, well, for positive A, I'm taking the integral of an increasing function. So that's going to be monotone for stochastic dominance. For negative A, I'm taking the integral of a decreasing function. So that's going to be anti-monotone, but then the normalization makes it monotone again. Now, in fact, this, only, this works for a different than zero. If I take the limit a equals to zero, I get to the expectation. I take the limit to infinity, I get the maximum. I take the limit to minus infinity, I get the minimum. So in fact, if I allow this parameter to take values from minus infinity to infinity, including minus infinity and infinity, then these Ka's include all the examples that we've, that we've seen so far. Okay? So, so, so these are some examples that, that are easy to come up with. The question is, is there anything else? Well, okay, you can take averages of different Ka's. I can take K17 times one half plus K18 times one half. And I can take integrals of different Ka's, but the main theorem is that this is it. So, so here's the exact formulation. If I have a monotone additive statistic on L infinity, then I'm going to have a probability measure on this closure of R, R, R bar, which is R union plus minus infinity. So this, I'm going to choose this parameter A according to this measure. And phi of X is just going to be the average of these Ka's according to, these, to this measure. So another way of saying this is that these Ka's are the extreme points of the set of monotone additive statistics. Everything else is just... Um, you know, the barycenter of some measure on these, on these extreme points. Okay. Um, and I'll say without proving this, that if we restrict ourselves to non-negative random variables and or integer valued bounded random variables, then the same result still holds. Okay. So, so this is the main result. I want to take a second to let it let, let you think about this for a second if you need to and ask any questions. Okay. Um, so, so is somebody asking something or is this uh, no. can, can I ask one question? Yes, please. Um, in the previous one, if it's uh, non-negative, but it doesn't have a moment generating function, does that mean that the measure uh, over K at A is only, let's see, no, it's no, only... No. So, so, so here I'm only talking about non-negative bounded random variables. Oh, you're still bounded. Fine. I'm Thank you. I'll talk about uh, yeah. larger... Okay. Yeah. So what, what, the point with this last bullet is that if I make the set even smaller, I go to integer ones or just um, non-negative ones, we, we still get the same result. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Sorry, this, I see that this wasn't clear from the bullet. Okay, so let, let, me tell you, let me tell you about the proof. And here's a question um, that's, that's related to how we prove this. And, here, and the question is this. Take two bounded random variables, X and Y. When is there a bounded independent random, random variable Z such that X plus Z stochastically dominates Y plus Z? Okay. So clearly, if x dominates y, if I add to both of them an independent z, still x is going to dominate y. But the question is, is it possible that x and y are not ordered in stochastic dominance, but after I add to both of them the same random noise, um, they, they, become, um, they, they become ordered. Okay, and sort of the first time 
you see this, you may think, oh, it's obviously not, because this would mean that the mass of x plus z is to the right of the mass of y plus z, and you'd be correct in thinking that. And this can't be true if it wasn't true before for x and y, because all I did was convolve them with the same thing, you know, shift them left and right and take averages. Um, well, as I'll see, I'll show you in a second, this actually is possible. Um, and it has interesting implications for us. What, so why is this interesting to our problem? Well, by monotonicity, if x is strictly bigger than y, if, sorry, if x dominates y, then phi of x is bigger than phi of y. I claim that it's enough that x plus z dominates y plus z for some z for phi of x to be bigger than phi of y. So we don't really need the stochastic dominance to get monotonicity, to get that phi of x is bigger than phi of y. It's enough that we get stochastic dominance if we add some additional noise. Why is that? Well, let's look. Phi of x plus phi of z is by additivity phi of x plus z. By monotonicity, this would be, then be bigger than phi of y plus z. And again, by additivity, this equals to phi of y plus phi of z. So I get that phi of x plus phi of z is greater than phi of y plus phi of z. I can cancel both sides, get that phi of x is bigger than phi of y. Okay, so, so if we can figure out when this happens, it'll tell us more about this phi. So here's an example of when this happens. I'm going to look at a random variable x. It's just um, 0 with probability 2 thirds and 1 with probability 1 third. Random variable y is uniform from minus 0 0.6 to 4. So here are the CDFs. And um, you can see that, the, that they're not ranked. So the CDF of x is not everywhere below that of y. There's a little kink where it's above. Now I'm going to add to both of them as z, which is this going to be minus one half or plus one half, each with probability one half. Now, wh what happens to the CDF of a random variable when I add an independent random variable to it? So, you know, if I look at a density, if I add a, a, an independent random variable to it, then I, I convolve it, right? I, I, I shift it left and right according to the distribution of what I'm adding and, and take the average of these. But the exact same thing happens to the CDF when I add z to x, what do I do to the CDF of x? I do the same thing. I, I move it left by 0.2 and right by 0.2 and take the average of these two things. And I do the same thing to the CDF of y, which means that I do the same thing to, this, to the difference between these CDFs. And when I do this convolution, it smooths things out and it smooths out this kink. And now after I do this, I get that, this, that the CDFs are ranked and we actually have stochastic dominance. So this is possible. So the question that we're going to ask is, well, when does this happen? Under what conditions on x and y is there an independent z so that x plus z dominates y plus z? So one thing to note is an impediment to the existence of such a z. It's impossible that such a z exists if phi of x is less than phi of y for any monotone additive statistic phi. Well, why is that? phi of x plus z is phi of x plus phi of z. If we're assuming that phi of x is less than phi of y, this is less than phi of y plus phi of z, which is then equal by additivity again to phi of y plus z. So we get that if phi of x is less than phi of y, then phi of x plus z is less than phi of y plus z. But then it's impossible that x plus z dominates y plus z because phi is monotone. Okay? So in particular, we know that these Ka's our monotone additive statistic. So if, if Ka of x is less than Ka of y, then this is impossible. So you know, if we unpack these Ka's, if the, mon if the moment generating function of x is higher than the moment generating function of y for some positive parameter, then it's impossible that we add a z and we get stochastic dominance because the moment generating function will still be ranked the same way after we add the z. The interesting thing is, it turns out that these are actually, are essentially the only obstructions. So here's sort of the main technical lemma. If you take x and y and L infinity, and if these Ka's are strictly bigger for every A for x than for y, so if the moment generating functions are ranked, and the expectations are ranked, and the, and the minimum and the maximum are ranked, 
then there is some z so that x plus z dominates y plus z. Okay, so, so if the moment generating functions are ranked the right way, then I can find some z so that independent, so that adding it to both sides gives me stochastic dominance. Um, so let me show you how to construct this z. I'll, I'll prove this lemma. So I'm going to denote by f and g the CDFs of x and y and say that they're supported, both of them, on minus n to n. We want to find a z with density h so that when we convolve x with h and y with h, the CDFs are ranked. The CDFs of the convol of the of x plus the CDF of x plus z is just the convolution of g with h. The CDF of y plus z is the convolution of f with h. Sorry, the other way around. Um, this is of x and this is of, of y. So we want to find the density h so that the convolution of g with h is pointwise higher than the convolution of f with h. And what I'm going to try is I'm going to try a Gaussian. So I'm, I'm missing a constant here, but th that's not going to matter. So I'm, I'm going to take a Gaussian density and I'm going to convolve it with the difference between these CDFs and I want this thing to be positive. Well, if I write out what the convolution means, I get this expression. Out here is some positive um, constant or, or number that, that doesn't change the positivity of this expression. Here inside, I have the difference between the CDFs, and I have these two terms, this red term and the blue term. So let's look at the blue term. We're only looking at x's between minus n and n. And we can take v to be very, very big. We can take the variance of this Gaussian to be very, very big. So we can get this blue term to be as close to 1 as we like on the range between minus n and n. OK? So let's just imagine that we have 1 here. Well, what do we have left? We have this expression left. If we do integration by parts, it's just the difference of the moment generating functions. And that's going to be positive by our assumption that the moment generating functions are, are ranked. Now, I need z to be bounded. So I actually need to truncate this Gaussian to get a bounded random variable. And I need to take care of the epsilons because this is not really equal to 1 and so on. But this is the, this is the idea of the proof. OK, so, so in, in other words, we, we can write in this lemma that if, if the, this normalized cumulant generating function is bigger for x than for y, then we can take a wide enough truncated Gaussian so that z, so that x plus z dominates y plus z. Any questions so far? Okay, so now what, what, is, what, is this, uh, what does this tell us? It tells us, okay, I'm just rewriting the lemma. If ka is bigger than ky, then x plus z is, dominates y plus z. Uh, can, can I interrupt you with a question that's perhaps irrelevant? If you can, if you know ka of x for all a's, you know x. You know the distribution, yes. Yeah, up to of, of, yeah, okay. For bounded random variables, yes, you, you, you know the distribution. Okay. Um, so, okay, so 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 um, now remember we talked about this. If x plus z dominates y plus z, then for any monotone additive statistic phi of x is bigger than phi of y. So as a corollary of these two observations, we get that if the ka's are larger than x, well, then x plus z is, is, dominates y plus z, so phi of x is greater than phi of y. Right? So if these, if these k's are ranked, then all the monotone additive statistics are ranked. And from here is just some functional analysis, Han Banach, to, 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 to get to the conclusion that every monotone additive statistic is just a convex combination of these. Okay, these are now the extreme points of, of this convex set of monotone additive statistics, because if they're higher for some x, then everything is higher for that x. Okay, so this. This, this might be a this might seem like a bit of a jump but I don't I don't want to go into these details but I'm glad to it, yeah is there any significance to the fact that you take you need a strict inequality on the ka's for all a's and 
you get a weak inequality. What happens if you have an equality for some A's or can be good, second? Good. So for this lemma, we actually need a strict inequality. Um, you get into trouble if you look at random variables whose essential maxima and minima are exactly the same. And there, this lemma is just not true with a weak inequality. But for our purposes, it's enough to have strict inequality. And then you, you, know, you perturb things a little bit and it works for every epsilon. So you take the limit and it works in general. So, so, so that, that, doesn't, that, that doesn't bother us. Any more thoughts or questions? Okay. Um, so I'm going to move on from, from L infinity, and I'm going to look at larger spaces of random variables. And first, I want to look at all the random variables that have a moment generating function. So I'll, I'll, I don't know if there's some standard notation of this, but I'll write this as LMGF. So all x. Um, where Ka is finite for all A and R, right? So they don't, they don't have a, a, a necessarily a maximum and a minimum, but they do have a moment generating function for every parameter A, which means also that for, for zero, they have finite expectations. So the theorem is very similar. Um, it's every, mon every um, monotone added statistic is still going to be an integral of these Ka's. But in this case, the measure mu needs to be compactly supported. So this parameter A has to be bounded. Otherwise, this will just diverge for some x's. But, but basically, you get the same result. This does take quite a bit of work, though, because when we, when we lose these bound, when we, when we give up the boundedness of the random variables, in some space, we lose compactness, and, 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 and we have to resort to a lot of approximation arguments to actually do this. But I won't go into it. Um, so here, here's a case that I want to talk a little bit more about. So I'm going to look at random variables satisfying Kramer's condition. And by that, I mean random variables that have a moment generating function in some neighborhood of the identity. So this is random variable x for which there exists some positive s, so that the moment generating its function is finite on the interval minus s, s. OK? Um, so here, these Ka's are no longer actually monotone additive statistics, just because they're infinite for some x. And we, we want these statistics to be functions to r. They're not allowed to take the value infinity. So the only one that's really left of these is the expectation. And it turns out that that's the unique monotone additive statistic. So you can think of this as a characterization of the expectation. On these, this collection of random variables, the only, um, the only um, um, monotone additive statistic is the expectation. And I want to tell you a little bit about how to prove this. And the proof is, again, going to go through this idea of adding noise and getting stochastic dominance, it turns out that on this space LC, if the expectation of x is greater than the expectation of y, then we can find some z so that x plus z is greater than y plus z. So it's enough here that the expectation is bigger, and we can find some additional noise z, which is also in this set of Kramer random variables, so that x plus z dominates y plus z. And this more or less finishes the proof because it implies that if you take any monotone additive statistic phi, well, if the expectation of x is bigger than the expectation of y, then phi of x is bigger than phi of y. So it turns out this implies pretty easily that phi of x actually has to equal the expectation because it's some monotone function of the expectation, but it also has to be additive, so, so, so that pins it down. Um, and could, could, you fact, Sorry, could you repeat what the class L upper C was? Yes. It's all random variables x for which the moment generating function is finite in some neighborhood of the identity. OK, thank you. Um, Right, so in fact here, 
I can take this z to have a Laplace distribution. This is a two-sided exponential distribution. So I have a, an, an exponent on both sides with some with the same parameter on, on, on both sides. So I want to show you a sketch of the proof of, of why, why this is true. Is the statement here clear? And yeah? Okay. Um, so I'm going to again denote the CDFs of X and Y by F and G. And I'm going to let H be this, the density of this, of an independent Laplace random variable Z. I'm again missing a constant here, but that's not going to be important. And like before, I want to show that the convolution of G with H is always above the convolution of F with H. So I want to show that this thing is constant. Is uh, not constant, is, is positive for all Y. Well, if we, we're going to have to take R to be small enough. We're going to need to take this, this Laplace to be wide enough. Um, now, showing that this thing is positive. Oh, sorry, th there shouldn't be an equality here. Um, I, I, yeah, the, the, the left side is, 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 is wrong. This is not equal, but this expression is positive if and only if this expression is positive. The only difference is I multiplied by this, by this positive number here, e to the r times the absolute value of y. So, so we want to show that this, this, this integral here is, um, is, is positive. Um, and so I, I want to look at the expression in the integral here. So we have, we have this thing, um, which I wrote here in blue. I'm going to call this, I'm, this I'm going to think of this as a function of x because we're integrating with respect to x, but it's parameterized by r and y. And um, this, is a, this is a drawing, the blue is, is a drawing of this function. It's, okay, what does it look like? I'm going to first draw this red function. The red function is just e to the rx, r times the absolute value of x. So it's an, an exponentially growing on both sides. The blue function is always equal to 1 at 0. That's what this normalization does. And, and the, you know, it, it looks like this Laplace density, except it's shifted so the center is at y. The important thing that it's always underneath this red function. Now, if we take r small enough, then this red function is integrable because the integral of this red function times g minus f, integration by parts, gives me the integral according to g and f of some exponent. And I know that the moment generating function exists, so this is going to be finite. So, so, so this integral of the red function times e times s it's finite precisely because x and y satisfy this Kramer condition. Now, if you, what r does, r controls how wide this is. When, when r goes to zero, this becomes wider and wider and wider. And if, if you think about it for a second, you'll realize that regardless of what y is, if, if I look at a particular x, it's going to, if I take r to, if I take r to zero, this function f of x for every given x, is going to converge pointwise to one. And this is uniformly over y. So, um, so I, be, because this blue function is dominated by the red function, I can use dominated convergence to say that this integral just converges to the integral of, of g minus f. Because this thing inside here just converges pointwise to one. Now, the integral of the difference of the CDFs is just the difference in the expectations, which by assumption is positive. OK. Um, so so, so, so that, that's the end of the proof. Again, I'm sort of rushing through it. I, it looks like I might finish kind of early. I, I apologize. Um, OK. So, so, so that was for this Kramer condition random variables. Now I want to look at LP. So this is the set of random variables X that have finite P moment. And here's the, here's the theorem. If P is larger than one, then the expectation is, is finite. The expectation exists. And it's the unique monotone additive statistic. If P is less than one, then the expectation doesn't exist anymore. But there's nothing else. 
There are just no monotone additive statistics. In particular, in the set of all the random variables, all distributions, there are no monotone additive statistics. Okay. Um, and as before, the main ingredient of the proof is that if I take x, y, and lp for p greater or equal to 1, then if the expectation of x is bigger than the expectation of y, I can find a z so that x plus z dominates y plus z. z will need to be an lp minus 1. So z somehow has to have fatter tails than both x and y. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into more details of, of this proof, but it, it actually takes a little bit of, of arguing. Um, I think this is the last thing I want to show. No, sorry, there's, there's yet something else. So I want to look at a, a set of random variables. I'm, I'm going to call it L1 plus because it's L1 plus some more random variables. And these are all the random variables, x, such that the limit as n goes to infinity of n times the probability that x is bigger than n exists. I just want this limit to exist. Okay? Now, this limit is equal to 0 for things in L1. That's an, that's an easy exercise. Um, but for things beyond L1, this could be non-zero. So L1 is strictly contained in this L1 plus. This L1 plus is also strictly contained in all L1 minus infinity. So this, this really sits between L1 and L.999. So I'm going to denote phi of x to be exactly this expression, this defining expression, the limit as n goes to infinity of the probability that x is greater than n. It turns out that this phi is monotone and additive. So this, this takes a few lines of proof, which I'll, which I'll omit. But, but it, it is, I mean, monotonicity is immediate just because each one of these, for every n, this expression is monotone with respect to stochastic dominance. But for additivity, you need to write something down. This is not exactly a statistic because for every constant, this is 0. In fact, this is 0 for all things in, in L1. But this is a monotone homomorphism. Of, of this convolution semigroup of the measures. It's sort of, in it's sort of a, a, a tail statistic, isn't it? I mean, it's yes, yes, it mostly yes, pays yes. attention to what happens far away. It only pays attention to the tail, exactly. Uh, in yeah. fact, it's, trans it's translation invariant. Because Almost, this is additive. the condition for the weak law, right, in some sense. This is Feller's condition for the, for the weak law. When the weak law holds, but the strong law doesn't, so in a sense, you could have taken the space of variables which have a pseudo expectation. That is that if you truncate them into this range, they, 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 their expectation converges to something. Maybe then you could have a more proper statistics on this more restricted space. All right, so the, po the point is that the variable is not that. enough symmetric, right? It's not sufficiently symmetric to have an expectation because, well, it, it could no, really tail, have no expectation. The tail is too... The tail is too thick to have an expectation. Yes, right. But, uh, but if the variable would also have been more or less balanced on positive and negative, and you would have this tail statistic, this tail condition, then in principle, you would have something which is sometimes called a pseudo expectation. Right. And maybe right. this would have been a statistic on this more restrictive set. Yes. So you, so you want to look at things where these two limits are the same when you go left and right. Right, exactly. Yes, yes. So we, we do we do that in the we do that in the paper. I, I didn't know this term pseudo expectation, and unfortunately due to my ignorance, but I I will maybe add this name to the paper. So thank you for, for pointing this out. Um so okay, so but, but the point of this exercise is that you can construct, you know, we showed that for, for LP only the expectation exists, for for LP less than one, there's nothing. But you can construct interesting spaces where more things exist. And in the paper, we have yet more examples of intermediate things that have all sorts of exotic um, monotone additive functions like this. OK, so um, the last thing I want to talk about um, may seem completely unrelated, but turns out to be very closely related. And um, 
what I'm going to do is, is seems like a very different exercise. So I'm going to look at a measurable space. And I'm going to look at pairs of measures. And I want to quantify the dissimilarity between them. I want to ask how different are two measures. So, you know, maybe the total variation distance is one way to do this. Um, another way to do this is, is maybe some kind of transportation uh, uh, distance. But I don't have a metric. I don't have a topology on the space. It's just a measurable structure. So I'm not going to be able to do anything like that. So in fact, what, what I want to do is I want to restrict to pairs of measures that are similar to each other in the sense that they're mutually absolutely continuous. And further, furthermore, the, the, the rate of Nikodim derivative is bounded from above and from below. So I want to look at pairs of measures that you know, exist in the same place. And, and furthermore, you, you know, the ratio of, of values that they assign to any set are, are bounded. And I'm going to call D a divergence if for any such sigma and tau, um, it's equal to zero only if sigma is equal to tau. Okay, so this is a very minimal requirement of something that measures dissimilarity. Now, I'm going to say that it's monotone if it satisfies what I call the data processing inequality. And the idea is this. If I push the two measures forward with the same function f, the dissimilarity only goes down. Right? So think of atomic measures. If I push them forward with the, same, with the same function, well, if this function is a bijection, then the distance should stay the same. And this is implied by this inequality. Otherwise, I'm sort of I'm uniting atoms. And I'm losing some fine grainness of, of, the, of the differences between the measures. Um, but this is similar to what's called the data processing inequality in, in, in other fields. So this, this is not completely made up. Okay? And I'm going to say that D is additive if for product measures, it's just the sum of the Ds for each um, for, for, you know, for, for, the, for the components. So D of a product, say we go one times sigma two, how dissimilar is that from tau one times tau two? Well, it's d of sigma 1 tau 1 plus d of sigma 2 tau 2. OK? So let's look at some examples. One example is the KL divergence. Another example is what's called, and the KL divergence, <coughs> notice, is the expectation of the log of the rate Nikodim derivative. There's what's called Rennie divergences which are the rate Nikodim derivative to some power a minus one. But what's really, really the way to think about this is this is the cumulant generating function of the log of the rate of Nikodim derivative. Right? So if I wrote here e to the log d sigma to d tau to the power a minus one, I could, I'll just cancel. But this is just the moment generating function of the log rate Nikodim derivative, which, for which I'm taking the expectation here. In fact, if I take this parameter a to one, I just get um, I just get the KL divergence. So these are all examples of these divergences that are monotone and additive. And the theorem again is that this is it. So everything else is now just going to be uh, an, an integral of these things. I have to write it as a sum of two integrals because the order matters. dA of sigma tau is not the same as tau sigma. So I need to take some averages of DAs with sigma and tau and some averages with tau and sigma. But everything really is just uh, uh, a sum or an integral of these things. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions at all? Is it interesting at all to look at uh, non-independent Zs or so conditions? Because maybe if you if you're allowed to have the Z as a function of the x and y, you can kind of put more mass on the lower part of the mass of the of the smaller one and create uh, dominance. And so conditions I, for existence. I haven't thought much about this. What I can tell you is that if you want a phi, a phi so that five x plus y is additive, is equal to 5x plus 5y for every x and y, 
-hmm. then this is easy to show that it's just the expectation. It was really already known by, I don't, I don't know, Komogoro. Mm -hmm. Right. T together with my... Mm -hmm. Where do these questions come from? Uh, who is asking this? Nati? Yes. Um, where do these questions come from? So there are some people in math who are looking at this, but really they come from economics. So their stochastic dominance is a very, very important concept. Um, but there's a big literature on partially ordered semi-groups and their homomorphisms. Um, and so I, what I showed you here, I think is already beyond what economists care about. And, uh, and I, I'm just interested in this for its own good. I always hear about them from Sergio Hart, so that's a good indication that uh, there's something to what you said. So, so here's an open question. Maybe I'll, I'll tell you one more thing. Um, so, so take all probability measures on the reals, and I want to look at um, at functionals on these probability measures that are additive with respect to convolution and are always non-negative. Okay, so one example is the variance, but the variance is not really an example because some things don't have a variance. But if you restricted yourself to L2, you would have the variance as an example of such a thing. So it's something that's always positive, always non-negative, and it's additive for independent random variance. So, so that there is, as far as I know, there's nothing known about this. Um, uh, I, I don't know if there's anything on the set of all random variables, on the set of all probability measures. I don't know if an L2, the variance is the unique one. I, I don't know anything at all. Um, there, there's a book by Rutza and Sekely from the 80s, these two Hungarian mathematicians, called Algebraic Probability Theory that has a lot of very beautiful things and the original results that don't appear anywhere else. And we actually use some of the results in some of the results that I, that I mentioned here. And they're interested in, they, they don't look at stochastic dominance, but they're just interested in homomorphisms of this convolution semigroup to R. Because the, the book is all about studying this convolution semigroup from an algebraic point of view. It's called algebraic probability theory. And, and they ask, for example, is there a homomorphism on the set of all random variables that extends the expectation? So that the answer is yes by some very general argument. More interesting show that they show that there is one that is um, that assigns zero to all symmetric random variables, for instance. They show that there isn't one that assigns a positive number to all positive random variables. Um, Sorry, Omar, can you uh, say that reference one more time? Um, let me maybe type it in the chat. The book is called Algebraic Probability Theory. And the authors, I'm def they're both Hungarian, so I'm going to write both of their names in mistake with mistakes, but it's something like this. Ooh, thank you. So th this, this open question that I mentioned about positive homomorphisms of the convolution semigroup, that's related to the decomposition of measures. So when can I write a measure as a convolution of two other measures? And oh, th there's, a, uh, there's a lot that's not known about that. Being a combinatorialist, I must know how to spell in Hungarian. In Ruzsa, is probably ZS and not SZ. OK, let, let me. Um, let me figure this out one second. Seke looks right, but uh, probably Ruja. Ibra Ruja. Yes, here it is. Yes. Here it is. Yeah. 
So yeah, so you're absolutely right. I got secondly right, but not not Ruza. But not the pronunciation of it. It's secondly. My uh, Hungarian grandmother <laughs> is very disappointed in me you are alive. So uh, only a question. Yeah. So um, you know, statisticians obviously are very interested in statistics of various kinds, minimal statistics, special statistics. So does this have any, any implications for, sta for, for, for statistics? And, uh, and well, I, I, I took some liberty with the term. When they say statistic, they don't mean the same thing that I said. What, what they think is you take some kind of empirical distribution. You take your data and you calculate some number based on yes. that. Yes. But somehow, you know, if you have a lot of data, then you can think about the distribution of the data there. And 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 apply the the statistics to that. So I so I, I took, but there are papers. So there's a, a paper by Lehman, who's this very famous statistician. A paper from the Bickel and Lehman from from the 80s or so, where they also quantify what they they call these things measures and not statistics. But I I didn't want to use the term measures because we'd have too many measures here. And they look at what they call location measures. So they also have these axioms like. Monotonicity with stochastic dominance is something that they look at, but they look at different things like um, uh, um, homogeneity and so on that 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 are different from what we're looking at. And uh, can you, uh, you you mentioned the term pseudo mean during the talk? Can you... I think Ohad Ohad mentioned it. Yes. So what is it? So it's a it, pseudo means no right. Uh, uh, not real, right? No, not the actual thing. And in this context, I said it for a pseudo expectation, which is okay, when yeah. you have a weak law, the weak law of large number holds, although you don't have an expectation. So the strong right. law has an if and only if, if you have an expectation, but the weak law can be extended a bit beyond. Yeah. And when it can be extended to some value, we say that this value is the pseudo expectation of right. Right. So. There's this notion in uh, functional analysis called weak L1. There's the L1 class, and there's a, 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 slight, a slightly or a, a larger class called weak L1, which is which is those random variables that, that satisfy Markov's inequality, right? So so if, if you have a finite mean, you have you have Markov's inequality, right? On, on the tail, you can you, you can have Markov's inequality even with that. You can have so now you take that inequality as a definition of of, uh, of your of your size, right? Right. That defines weak L1. So in my research, that came up, and that actually became a very important object. Is there any? Uh, have you uh, encountered that object? And uh, I'm, I'm, th th this might be more or less what the kind of thing we're looking at here. I'd have to think about it for a second, but it it, it looks well. It looks well. You, you we also want this limit to exist. So so not just say the limb soup to be fine. Right. 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 For me, limb soup this, was, was enough. Yeah. We we want the limit to exist. And then we get this monotone additive statistic so that the actual are there. Um, so one question to ask is, you know, a lot of a lot, many, many, many pages have been have been written about estimating the mean of a, a random variable. Right? Has anybody ever uh, expressed interest in estimating this this weak weak mean, weak L one mean? Is, you know, is, is that an, because that might this, be that might be easier to estimate. That might be uh, possible to estimate in a much broader class of distributions right yeah I I, I, I I don't know I mean th this this condition that this limit exists is you know it's a bit artificial we, we just wanted to construct something to show that there that there are other possibilities out there so I, I don't know if this is interesting to anybody else can I ask another question yes please. Um, so one of the things you had were two random variables which were not stochastically ordered but you add a z and they become stochastically ordered is there any of interest to look instead at real value instead of measures on the line where you're linearly ordered but instead look at measures in the plane where you just have a partial ordering would some of it go through is any of it interesting um yes yeah, so um um me and some and other people are working on this and in fact the same thing holds so you can do the same thing in Rn with the natural um, notion of stochastic dominance there, and you get the same result basically. That the moment generating function is what determines these things. Okay, that's a, that's a great question. Thanks. Okay, if there are no more questions, then let's say thanks, Omer, again. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Omer. Great talk. Good night. I'm going to go to sleep. Good night. Yes. <laughs> Good night.